Welcome back to another episode of the Build Show podcast. I'm your host, Matt Reisinger, and this is my opportunity that I get to nerd out with you a bit on a longer format. Many of you have seen me on the Build Show on YouTube, but this is my podcast. We just started this recently, and we've got a really good uh, podcast episode for you today. We're talking about the case for radiant heating, and I have a couple of experts uh, in the crowd for me today. Today's Build Show, sponsored by Warmboard. Let's get going. All right, so before we get into it, let me first introduce these two gentlemen who are on the podcast with me today. These are a couple of experts for us on radiant heating. This is Terry Allsberg, the CEO of Warmboard, and Paul Eisenstark, the tech director of Warmboard. Gentlemen, thank you for joining me. Uh, before I ask you guys, and, and one of my first questions for you guys is going to be the history of radiant, let me first define what I mean by radiant heating. You know, most houses in America, including a lot of what I've done over the years, are using forced air for heating in the house and if y'all remember uh, from high school physics class there's three time there's three types of heating uh, in the world or three three uh, versions of heating that happens conduction convection and radiation using your oven as an example your oven has a convection feature and when that convection feature is on there's a fan that blows in your oven so that's a good example of convection where that hot air is kind of blowing through and transferring that heat Conduction is what happens when you put your kit, your hand on your kid's forehead to find out if they have a fever. Your hand is conducting that heat from their forehead and you can tell, oh, this is a couple of degrees hotter than my skin temperature. That heat is conducting through by touching it. And then there's radiation and that's really what we're talking about. This is kind of like the broiler in your oven, right? When you turn your broiler on to broil, you put the cheese casserole in there and very quickly it heats up that cheese through radiant heat heat. So with that being said, Terry, first off, how did I do on my analogies? Were those fair analogies from my recollection of uh, high school physics class? <laughs> two, th two thumbs up. All right. Good deal. Terry, you've been in this business a long time. Um, and in fact, if you would tell us your quick background, are, are you the, uh, the original founder of Warmboard? Is that right? Yes, I'm the founder of Warmboard. I'm the inventor of Warmboard, uh, and I uh, I've cleaned the bathrooms, knew a bunch of other things too. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Well, tell us if you would before we talk specifically about Warmboard, and we will spend a little bit of time talking about your products today. But the, the podcast title is "The Case for Radiant," and before we get into the case for Radiant, I'd love for you to tell us what's the history. Uh, you know, where did Radiant start, and what's the history of uh, radiant heat in American homes? I'll go way, way, way back. Human beings have always warmed themselves with radiant, whether they're basking in the sun during the day mm -hmm. or whether they're warming themselves by a fire uh, at night, that's radiant. So the, the warmth you feel off a fire is radiant. The warmth you feel off the sun is radiant. Gotcha. But, that, but as far as radiant floor heating, that kind of began with the, the Romans and actually the Koreans were doing it in the Far East at about the same time. The Romans called their systems hypocaust systems, which made it's a Latin word that means to burn under. Huh. And, uh, uh, and the Koreans, uh, they call their systems Andal systems, which uh, stood for hot stone. And so these both did this about 2,000 years ago. And it was really the first form of central uh, heat because up until then, you had a fireplace. You burned, you know, lots of fireplaces. You know, every little room got had a little fireplace in it. That's kind of what heated it. Uh, the Romans figured out what would happen if we took that fire and we ran the flue gases underneath stone slab floors that would heat the stone. And then uh, the stone, because it was heavy and massive, uh, as the fires would fluctuate, it had kind of a nice flywheel effect that evened out the, the rise and, and fall of heat on that floor and also prevented the floor from getting too hot because it's kind of a poor conductor. And so uh, as a result, you weren't walking on a, a pancake griddle, which would burn your feet if it was made out of steel. Yep. So they made it out of stone, so it didn't get that hot. So it was a kind of an early you know, form of a control system. And the, and the Koreans had a similar kind of a, a system, like you say, in the Far East. And then uh, in about the late 1800s, because the Roman Empire went as far as England, some people in England were looking at some Roman ruins and they decided, hmm, maybe that's the way to do central heat. Because if you've ever been to England, you see these houses that have about eight chimney pots at the either end of the house because they have eight fireplaces in the yeah. house. And that's how they, they heated their homes. And then somebody decided, well, what would happen if we did something like the Romans? Only instead of fires underneath floors, we'll put pipes in a concrete slab, slab on grade. Hmm. Well, uh, that'll heat the slab, that'll heat the house. And that was probably the, the modern era of reading began there. And, and how, then, about a, uh, how about in American homes then? When did we start doing it in the U.S.? 
That's a good question. Now, Frank Lloyd Wright was one of the early pioneers of it. Everybody knows about Frank Lloyd Wright's architecture, mm-hmm. probably the most famous residential architect of the, the 20th century. But uh, he learned about radiant in the Far East because both the Japanese and the Koreans were doing it. He spent some time in Japan when he was doing the Imperial Hotel. And I think he stayed in a radiant home. He liked it. And he came back to uh, the United States and found some of the early patents in Radiant. Uh, he was an architect and design and got some patents. I'm an architect. I got some patents, too. But he he was a little bit ahead of me. Oh, and cool. virtually all of his houses were Radiant heated. And uh, all the way up until about World War II, uh, virtually all Radiant was done in slab on grade. It was concrete uh, poured on, on, on the soil with uh, pipes or tubes in it of some sort. Uh, a guy named Arthur Levitt uh, uh, founded two communities called Levitt Towns. One was in Pennsylvania and one was on Long Island. And they're fairly famous. They built about, I think, about 11,000 homes between the two uh, uh, projects. Mm-hmm. And uh, it really popularized radium. People just love the comfort of it. He did it because he thought it was cheap. It turns out that radium's got a kind of a, um, a bad rap for being expensive. I'm not mm-hmm. sure it's well earned. But back in his day, he thought it was the cheapest way for him to build tract homes. Interesting. And they were they were very, very comfortable. And out on the West Coast, a guy named Eichler did uh, a similar number of homes all over the Bay Area. These were much nicer architecture, very modern architecture. And they popularized it. And again, all slab on grade. But the early, uh, those early slab on grade with pipes and systems tended to fail because concrete always cracks. It's a matter of time before it cracks someplace. And when you have a pipe that goes across that crack, it's going to work hard at that crack as it expands and contracts with it with uh, temperature. And these systems would often fail. I think about 50 percent of the, uh, the Levittown systems have failed due to corrosion and cracking problems. And uh, we've done a lot out here because we're on the West Coast. We've done a lot of conversions of Eichlers for the same reason that that about 50 percent of the Eichlers failed. Interesting. And then uh, PEX tubing was invented in about the 1960s by Upenor in uh, or by Wurzbo, actually, in Sweden. And that changed the reliability of radiant hugely because it was a highly durable plastic pipe monolithic that almost forever. And in fact, that, that particular tubing technology has become so reliable and so popular that we now use it for the potable um, plumbing in most houses. So just, most just, houses these days are not plumbed anymore with copper. They're plumbed with PEX. I just plumbed um, my house in, uh, in Upanor PEX. It was great. And I was able to really reduce my fittings down to very few because of its flexibility and able to uh, kind of snake through my walls like, like wire might. And there's well over a dozen companies makes PEX tubing now. It's pretty much of a commodity. It's just highly reliable. It lasts hundreds of years. Uh, it doesn't tend to get gunked up on the inside like uh, uh, copper or steel pipe does with calcium deposits, that sort of thing. So for a lot of reasons, that's why uh, PEX has become popular, both in the potable side, but especially in the reading side, because it's so reliable, it just doesn't crack or corrode. Yeah. And the term PEX, by the way, translates to cross-link polyethylene, just for the record. Uh, the tech guy. Is. Thank you, Paul, yeah. for, uh, for sure. getting us nerdy. I appreciate that. <laughs> All right. Now, when I think Radiant, though, Terry, I think uh, like the house that I owned for a while, that was a 1929, 1930 bungalow. It was a Sears and Roebuck house that I owned in Portland, Oregon. And that's the only time I've ever lived with Radiant. And throughout my house and every bedroom and my major spaces, I had this uh, radiator, you know, a uh, cast iron radiator that was that had been painted a bunch over the decades of the house had been built. Uh, and in my basement, I had a steam uh, generating boiler that produced my domestic hot water and my steam for my system. Uh, And I remember that being super, super comfortable. Uh, But I also remember it uh, making a lot of pinging noises and uh, kind of groaning occasionally. Uh, Are are those types of systems still being installed today or are those just systems that are being serviced that have been installed decades ago? Well, there are really three forms of of radiant. Uh, There is, as you mentioned, there is uh, wall radiators. There's baseboard radiators, mm-hmm. and then there's floor uh, radiators, where, where it's the floor that does the radiation of the uh, of the infrared. And uh, uh, most early hydronic or steam systems were wall radiators or baseboards. And the reason why they make those pinging noises is because they run on very comparatively hot water. And in the case of steam, it's over 212. So the rapid expansion contraction of metal, when you have two dissimilar pieces of metal next to each other, it's going to make mechanical noises like that. The snap, crackle, pop, pinging, you know, that sort of thing is is pretty much a, a function of the high temperature of water that's run through either baseboard or wall radiators. That makes sense. Uh, radiant, uh, radiant is deadly silent. That's one of its great advantages. This is a very, very quiet system. Yeah. I love my house because it's, I mean, I, I lay in bed at night. I live about uh, a half a mile from the ocean. 
and I can hear waves crashing on the beach a half mile away through a bunch of houses and neighborhoods because my house is so quiet. My ears get so attuned to the quietness and they become very sensitive and I can hear a wave crashing on the beach. Because there's away. no forced air fan going in your system, right? With your radiant system. Yeah, we're going to go into a lot of the advantages of radiant, but to me personally, quiet. It's a bit, good night's sleep. I love a good night's sleep. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, that's one of the beauties of, of radiant is a quiet uh, uh, bedroom. The other uh, nice advantage of radiant over these other forms is you were talking about convection. And anytime you take uh, air and you heat it up, and that's basically convection is heated air. Because as you heat air, to get all nerdy here, the molecules move further apart. That means they're more buoyant. People sometimes think that heat rises. That's not true. Hot air rises. And so one of the problems with both baseboards and uh, wall radiators, and especially with forced air, is that the, the, the uh, uh, hot air is very buoyant, and it makes a beeline to the second story of your house and makes your bedroom too hot. Yeah, we call that and, stratification, right? Where there's yes, a that's, different that's temperature. Stratification. To get all techy. So, uh, so let's dive more into that, though. Uh, you know, we you gave us the kind of the history of radiant. Let's make the case for radiant. What are, besides, um, besides a good night's sleep and a really quiet system? What are the cases, Terry, for radiant, or or what are the other uh, reasons why you're hearing your customers opting for radiant compared to traditional, let's say, forced air systems? I could give you a laundry list, but I'll start off with item number one, and it's huge on the list. In all caps, underline, bold, you know, font, comfort. Yeah. And define that. What does going, that mean? Or, or tell us how that provides comfort. Well, that's an interesting concept. We, I try to teach my, my salespeople this. I say, uh, I ask them, define comfort. And everybody struggles with it. And actually, the, way, the best way of defining comfort is the absence of discomfort. Hmm. We know we have our cruel shoes on. We can't wait to take them off at the end of the day. Our feet are hot and sweaty. They raised a blister and this and that. And uh, so you notice your shoes when they're uncomfortable all day long. When you've got those nice fairy top sliders on or your comfy slippers on or something like that, you forget you have uh, shoes on. And so to me, the essence of a comfortable heating system is one that you don't know you have. Hmm. You ignore it. You just walk around feeling perfectly comfortable all day long. The temperature is just right. You don't hear any noise. You don't feel hot air blowing on you. Hmm. Your house is not particularly dusty. All these things contribute to that overall general big concept of comfort Hmm. and especially in a custom home, especially with the cost of construction these days, when anybody is spending in it and construction starts at about $300 a square foot these days. And I think it's going even higher by the minute as we watch uh, the inflation that's going on in the construction industry. So when you're paying that kind of money for, uh, for a house, why do you, why do we build houses at all? Anyhow, if we lived in the tropics, we might have a thatched roof with no walls because, you know, and that's it. Keep the rain off you and you're done. Yeah. But but uh, if we live in North America, any place, then um, uh, even down in Texas, even in Austin, you guys in Texas found out it gets cold down there every so often, doesn't it? Yeah, this winter it did. That's for sure. And so the biggest thing you want out of your, your house is protection from the elements. Uh, Philip Johnson, a very famous architect, succinctly said, architecture is shelter period, end of sentence. Mm -hmm. Shelter from what? Shelter from the elements. That's what we do it for. And so because it's cold outside, we build houses so we can control our environment inside. So it ain't the same as outside. And then once you decided that you want to do that, you figure as long as I spent 300 plus per square foot to build this house, I might as well be the right temperature all the time in every room, whether it's the upstairs, the downstairs, whether it's a little used room or a much used room, maybe like our bathroom is a little bit warmer, 72, 74 degrees. We might like our bedrooms a little cooler, 67, 68 degrees. We might like our living areas right in the middle about uh, 70 or so. And this is one of the great advantages of radiant is that uh, it is very commonly zoned by zoning. I mean that you can have multiple thermostats in multiple spaces in your, your house. We typically, I'd say our average warmer project has eight zones in it on average. And uh, usually most every room has its own thermostat. And so uh, I had two kids and uh, one of them liked his uh, uh, bedroom about two degrees warmer than my daughter liked her bedroom. And they got to pick their own temperature. They didn't have to argue over it. Wow. Be in, most, in most forest air houses, you have one thermostat and everybody argues over it all the time. And they're playing with it all the time. That's another way that, that the radiant is better is you don't play with your thermostats if it's done correctly. Yeah. Now, not all radiant systems can do that, but our particular system does. That's one of our bragging rights with warm board is we're a very fast responding, uh, very well controlled system with the result that minute by minute, hour by hour, every room in your house, 24, seven, 365 is the temperature you prefer. That's pretty and awesome. When it's the right temperature that you prefer. You don't notice it. 
that's comfort. Also, Terry, now what I'm seeing in terms of comfort, architecture is changing. I'm seeing the plans that come through one board is a lot of homes that have really high ceilings, you know, vaulted ceilings mm-hmm. and high ceilings in tile and marble, storm floors, hardwood floors. If you try to heat those places with high ceilings and marble floors or hardwood floors, it's very, very difficult with a four stair system. The last um, house I did really in my architectural practice, Paul talks about it all the time. It's a house here in Santa Cruz County. Yeah. And, and it happens to have a, uh, a 22 foot ceiling height in its Ooh. great room. Dang. And, uh, and it's got Tuscan tile on the floor. And that it has a whole one side of the, the room has got a wall of windows on it. And he says, if this was not warm board heated, it says this would be an unlivable room, but it's their favorite room in the house. How about that? That's amazing. Terry, yeah. I, I, I want to uh, ask you about that stratification we talked about earlier. You know, it's really common uh, for me to hear people ask questions about how to fix the stratification on their house because their two-story house has a single forced air furnace or maybe their three-story house and the upstairs is hot when they don't want it to be and vice versa and people are asking me about zone dampers and air share fans and you know all these things how does radiant um compare when it comes to stratification well, it has an inherent advantage because it turns out that we use half-inch PEX tubing and uh, the maximum length you need to run one of those tubes underneath the floor is about 250, maybe 300 max, but you've got to keep it around 250. Uh, so if you have, let's say, a 3,000 square foot house, you're going to have, uh, what, about uh, 12 zones minimum. I mean, 12 loops minimum in the floor. Uh-huh. And, and each one of those loops is connected to a manifold. And on top of the manifold is a valve. And the control system opens and closes these valves as is, uh, as heat is called for by a thermostat. So your thermostat calls for heat in your bedroom, but your, your master bath doesn't need it, but maybe your bedroom does. What's well, going to open up those valves according to the signals it gets from its thermostat. And it's going to control that temperature individually from other ones. And so the, the very nature of, uh, yeah, this is an actuator valve that sits on top of a manifold. Got it. It's a little electric device. And, um, and so the, the thing is that because of multiple loops in your floor, each loop can be individually controlled. It's different from forest air. Forest air, you have one trunk line of one big duct that runs down a house. With one temperature of air. Of it. It, yeah, and it, and it has one temperature of air that's going down it, and it comes out of registers in each room, and those registers are passive. Now, they usually have damper controls on them, but aside from spinning that little thumb wheel that nobody ever spins on their, in their houses, mm-hmm. you don't have any re- real individual room-by-room control. Yep. So you will often find one room, the room maybe that has the thermostat is the right temperature, and all the other rooms have the wrong temperature, either too hot if they're upstairs, too cold if they're downstairs. I, I, a lot of times I go skiing up in Tahoe and I'll rate one of these uh, three-story condos that are very you know, typical on ski slopes. And they usually have the living area in the middle and they have a loft upstairs and then they've got some bedrooms downstairs. And then the kids are sleeping upstairs and they're kicking all the covers off and uh, taking a sauna. Everybody downstairs is calling up management to see if they can send over a couple of extra comforters because it's too cold downstairs. <laughs> and the middle floor is just about right. And that's fairly typical for forest air. Totally. Totally. And the more extreme the climate, probably the more that that happens would be my guess. Exactly. Um, okay. So we've talked comfort. We've talked how it solves some stratification issues. We've talked about quiet. Talk to me about indoor air quality. Is there a case for radiant when it comes to people that are really interested in good air quality in their house? That's where we get most of our leads points for, for a radiant system is because we are, uh, we've all seen those ads from companies that will clean out your air ducts. Mm -hmm. So uh, you see inside, you see cobwebs and rat droppings and dead insect skeletons and God knows what's down there Mm -hmm. and uh, leftover toys that fell down the register, et cetera, et cetera. And there's these companies that will come in there and vacuum out your ducts once a year or once every other year or something like that, and that reduces it. Well, what happens in those systems is that when that fan blows through that duct, it's re-aerosoling all that crap that's down there. Yep. And uh, and it's put it all over your house, and all the horizontal surfaces get a little dusty. And we have a non-trivial number of clients that come to us, but we don't always do rich people's houses. We do a lot of modest-sized houses where people have allergies or other things that concern them, asthma, mm-hmm. sufferers, things like that. And uh, uh, the reason why uh, warm board does a better job of that than a forest air system does is because the air is still. And because it's still, any particulates that are in the air are going to settle out slowly. They're going to fall on the floor. Your vacuum cleaner will pick it up and get rid of it. And it's not re air sold around. Yeah. And so, awesome. in fact, that was one of the reasons why I invented warm board was both my kids have asthma. 
Mm. And uh, and I started reading you know, architectural magazines about uh, why radiant was considered ideal for people with allergies and asthma. And I got to tell you, after I, uh, I installed it in my system, uh, it's almost like my kids, uh, you know, they're healed. You know, they could throw away their crutches and walk. I, oh, I can now see, you know, it's, uh, their, their asthma went away. <laughs> and, uh, and it was largely due to that. So that is a very strong reason why a lot of people select radiant. And for my nerdy building scientists out there, that also means we don't have ducks that are, let's say, forced outside of your conditioned envelope. Like in Texas, where I am, uh, most houses are slab on grade and there's a huge amount of ducks and duct work up in the attic. Uh, and besides Terry's case for uh, spiders and rats in those ducks, we also have a lot of condensation that happens, um, which when condensation happens on those ducks that are outside of the envelope, you normally see some black stuff happening there as well, uh, either inside or outside those ducks. So there's, there's a lot of nasty things that happen when those ducks get out of the condition envelope. Uh, well, that's so- another nasty thing about forest air. I was in a forest air heated home. And right above the, the bed in the bedroom I was staying in, there was a ductwork that was up in the attic. And so when the, the, the heat would come on initially, you don't get any heat. The first thing that comes out is cold air because mm-hmm. it's up in the attic. Yep. So I get a blast of cold air for about uh, a minute or two, waking me up. And then it's followed by a blast of hot, dusty air. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've heard people describe um, uh, radiant uh, uh, forest air systems as hot dust systems. They don't say that they're hot air systems. They're hot, <laughs> hot dust systems. Hot systems. <laughs> I call them scorched air systems for the record. <laughs> that's awesome. By the way, that's an interesting little thing here because it's very prevalent in North America. Like 90 some percent of all houses are forest air heated in North America. It's not the same in the rest of the world. The rest of the world thinks we're crazy. Yep. Europeans think that forest air is barbaric. Why would you want to blow hot, dusty air on yourself all day long? Yeah. And, uh, and in Korea, where the Andal systems were created because it's, it goes so far back in their culture, 98% of all homes in Korea are uh, uh, radiant. It's right? upside down with North America. North America, 98% are not radiant. Yeah, yeah. But what that's a- changing. It's growing. What am I missing on this case for radiant? I think there's a huge indoor air quality. There's a huge comfort and quiet case. Uh, are there, you know, you said you had a laundry list for us. What, talk to me about efficiency, there's, Paul. There's, well, efficiency is a big component of radiant floor heating compared to forced air. One thing you can do is, Terry was mentioning earlier in the conversation, is the zoning. You could keep some, if you have a home, you could keep some of the rooms super toasty and comfortable, say 70 or 72 degrees and rooms that you're not using, you can keep them nice turned down and not raise the fuel. You can keep Mm. them down at 60 or 62 or whatever you're comfortable with. So in that case, you're saving a ton of fuel with the zoning uh, capabilities. And in in California, we have have our energy code here, which is title 24. And they give you a 15% energy credit just for having any hydronic system. And the reason why is forest air systems have an inefficient return air path. So you blow hot air out of a register into a room. You usually don't have a return air register in that room, which means you pressurize that room, which means some of the air is being pushed out past your weather stripping and your infiltration, exfiltration control to get all nerdy. And um, uh, so there's, uh, there's losses due to that. Plus, uh, a, a duct is typically six inches in diameter, has a lot of surface area, which is e- equals heat loss. And our tubes go through a little half inch diameter tube, which has much less surface area. So uh, my parents used to have a ranch house at, at, where the ductwork ran down to the basement. And uh, the last uh, bedroom on the duct run never got any heat. Hmm. All the heat was lost just going, and they call this parasitic losses. So parasitic losses are losses not directly related to conditioning the space, but just adhering to the mechanics of the system. Right. And so uh, uh, as a result, Title 24 gives you a 15% uh, uh, energy credit just for having any form of hydronic. On top of that, there was a great study done at Kansas State University, and they found that the radiant systems, radiant floor systems, as opposed to wall radiators and baseboards, can have efficiency gains over forced air as high as 25 to 40%. This is not nothing. This is big energy savings. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think we've made a pretty good case uh, and we're 20 minutes in already. Let's switch gears. I want to ask you guys to give me an overview of the radiant options for people out there. And then I'm also going to give you a few minutes of uh, why warm board is, in your opinion, uh, a better option. So first off, Terry, what are the options for radiant? If someone goes, all right, I'm sold. I like this. Uh, what are the four or five different ways that they could do radiant in their house? Uh, and also tell me the options for equipment to make that hot water, if you would. 
The uh, uh, our industry is dominated by slab on grade radiant because it is the least expensive form of radiant. If you're already pouring a four inch thick concrete slab uh, on sand, gravel, you know, uh, uh, vapor barrier, typical, you know, layers of a uh, slab on grade system or insulation. Yeah, and, and you put uh, tubes in that slab and you run it through there, uh, the slab will get warm, it will heat your house, and the the, the increase in cost is the cost of the tubing, the manifolds, the boiler equipment, but you can definitely get radiant for under $10 a square foot if you're doing a uh, uh, slab on grade. Not bad. Um, so that's, that's uh, overwhelming the most popular option. Uh, and because people are used to slabs historically, ancestrally, uh, back in, uh, I think it was about the 50s or 60s, uh, it's when uh, gypsum concrete started becoming an option on frame floors, where it's not just slab on grade, but the second floor of the house, they would put a slab there. And they were just trying to mimic what they were doing with Portland cement slabs on the, on the grade. Hmm. And that dominated for a while, too. Then uh, Warm Board and some other options came along uh, that decided that maybe we're doing it all wrong. My background is uh, in architecture and physics. I started off in engineering physics. You wanted to know about my background. I started off in engineering physics before I transferred to architecture. And so I learned a little bit about uh, thermodynamics. That's a big part of physics. And it always seemed crazy to me that we were using concrete to conduct heat because what any radiant floor panel does is really simple. It conducts heat from water in a tube to the surface of your floor, period, end of sentence. And as you make that, that uh, uh, panel that's conducting the heat more and more conductive, as conductivity goes up, water temperature can go down. Hmm. It's always cheaper to heat water to a low temperature than a high temperature. Right. Also, your equipment always lasts longer when it's running at a low temperature rather than a high temperature. You know this from operating a car. If you run around with your foot on the gas pedal at red line all day long, your engine is not going to last very long. Mm -hmm. But if you drive more into sweet spot of where the, the engine likes to operate, all the equipment lasts longer. So um, conductivity is king as far as I'm concerned. So we have seen um, less and less of the gypsum concrete systems and more and more of what Warmberg pioneered, which is the concept of high conductivity and low mass. And just to add to the uh, chips and concrete, um, the history of it, it was really invented for commercial buildings originally for sound and fire mm -hmm. uh, safety. I've done it for sound before in my, in my yes. houses. Exactly. That was the history of it. To add it, uh, to be using it for a radiant system was kind of more of an afterthought. Hmm. It really wasn't invented for radiant heat. It was invented for fire and sound. Uh, and that's why, as Terry is pointing out, it's not a conductive product. Um, so it was kind of an afterthought and what is not what it was engineered for. And, and it, ca it caused a problem, both it and slab and grade, even more so than gypsum concrete, uh, caused a problem because the high mass took a while to heat up. Mm -hmm. And so one of the, you were asking, we haven't gotten into downsides of radiant. Uh, if I had to get, say, three key downsides of radiant, uh, number one is cost. Because it is more expensive than forest air. There's no question about it. Yep. We tell our clients expect about 10 to $12 more per square foot over the cost of a forest air system to put a radiant system in. Now, one of the reasons why it's becoming more popular is as the cost of construction goes up and up and up, that $10 is less of a percentage of the overall cost. It tends to make it, you know, pencil out a little better. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. And um, um, so... Um, uh, that was one of the downsides uh, is cost. And another downside is uh, um, inability to use all the floor curvings that you want. It's generally been considered a no-no in radiant to use carpet on top of radiant. Mm -hmm. um, Warm board doesn't say that at all because uh, our big bragging right as a, as a radiant panel is we're the most conductive radiant panel that's made on planet Earth. So, Terry, and, for, and for those who haven't seen your panel, can you explain that in words, knowing that uh, some people are listening and not watching the podcast? How can you explain your panel? Let me, I'll be back in one second. All right. So, uh, well, while we're missing Terry, I'll explain real quick. Um, uh, my first radiant job that I, or my first warm board job that I saw uh, was with uh, my friend and architect Steve Basic. Steve specified it on a house in Boston that was a remodel project. Uh, and Steve and I, like most builders, are typically using three quarter or maybe inch and an eighth plywood or uh, Advantex subfloor. And so, in that job that I saw, he swipped, he swapped out his standard Advantech that he might have used, which was inch and an eighth, with an inch and an eighth uh, warm board panel. And on one side, it looked like regular plywood, but then you turned it over and it was green, like a four by eight sheet of green that looked like. It had a molded, uh, you know, garden snake uh, indent through the whole panel. And 
uh, Terry, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's an aluminum skin on the uh, four by eight inch and eight thick panel that then is a, a place for you to snap in tubing uh, so that that tubing then when it gets snapped in is basically radiating that heat from the tubing into an aluminum skin, which is on the entire face of the four by eight. How'd I do in explaining that in words, Terry? Pretty close. I don't know if you can see this panel right here. This is Wormborg. Yeah, it is a, uh, four, a four by eight sheet of Tunga Group plywood, just like any other structural subfloor. It's APA rated, exposure one, classic uh, sturdy floor. On top, we have this aluminum surface. It's painted green here. And we did that so that it's easy on carpenter's eyes and it retains chalk lines better. Mm. But that's all aluminum. It's, it's a very pure form of aluminum, too. We use... Um, um, 1060 alloy aluminum, which is 99.6% uh, pure aluminum. That's why we're so conductive. And is it, so real, this is, it, is it real thick, Terry, that aluminum it skin? Is, it is 25 thousandths of an inch thick. It's, uh, there are other aluminum panels out there. They're typically losing, using aluminum anywhere from 4 thousandths thick. Some of them use it 15 thousandths thick. We're the only people using stuff this thick. And the reason why we use it is, as you can see from this panel here, we have to stamp this groove in this aluminum here. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that if you make the aluminum too thin, it tears. So we had to use aluminum thick enough so that it wouldn't tear. And it turns out that was a good thickness for also very good thermodynamics. Mm. So uh, um, we know from buying cookware that if you want to buy a cheap uh, uh, frying pan, it's got a very thin bottom on it. Right. And you find that your eggs are running on one side and they're burning on the other side. So it's not very even. Then you go out and you buy gourmet cookware and it's got a thick aluminum bottom on it. Because why? Because it gives more even heat. It cooks the food better. And, and we're the that same heat. concept. Thermodynamics is pretty straightforward. Yeah. And then uh, realizing a lot of you are listening to this and can't see that panel in Terry's hands, then basically when you walk into the house while it's under construction, uh, this green facer, which is aluminum, which has a channel cut, uh, kind of pre-cut through it, the plumber is then snapping the uh, PEX tubing in place. And then the hardwood floor guy comes in, and this is where I visited Steve Basic with that house under construction. The hardwood floor contractor then can see all of the piping. It's on the top side of the floor, not on the bottom. He can avoid hitting it with his, uh, with his nail gun. It makes it really easy for him. And his nail gun penetrates right through that aluminum into the uh, plywood subfloor. And you're basically adhering uh, or nailing slash you could glue it as well uh, your hardwood floor right onto that panel is that right yeah i don't know if they can see my my camera image here but this is uh, uh some herringbone uh, white oak that's been nailed on top of warm board and you can see how you can see the tubing as you're nailing it and so you can avoid it yeah so your feet basically as you're as you're walking on that finished floor that tubing is only three quarters of an inch let's say if you have three quarter hardwoods below you but the green facer on that aluminum is spread out under the entire floor. So the heat from the tubing is transferring not just to the floor where the tube is, but also through that entire aluminum skin, which is then radiating up. So then my question then, Terry, is um, do you can you with your feet as you walk with your bare foot across the floor, can you tell, oh, the tube's right here because it's a lot hotter on my foot here. And then and then as I step over there, oh, it's colder here. So this must be uh, an in-between spot. Are you able to notice that difference on top of that floor later? No, not with warm board. Um, that that pro um, um, property is called striping. It, it's always going to be a little warmer directly above a tube than halfway between two tubes. And that will, that will be true for warm board and any other radius system. It's just a law of thermodynamics that that has to happen. The question is how much variation is there going to be? And a warm board, a variation is between one and three degrees between top dead center tube and midfield. That's just below the threshold of a human being to detect the difference. So uh, most people walk on a warm board floor in their bare feet. They'd have to think really long and hard if they think they may be standing on a hmm. tube that's maybe a degree or two warmer than the adjacent floor. Whereas in other systems, you can sometimes see variation as high as 8 to 10 degrees. Interesting. And that's one of the reasons why so many other rating systems obsess over tubing spacing. Because one of the ways you reduce that striping is you space the tubes closer together. So it's very, very common in a lot of other systems. You see tubing space as close as six or seven inches apart. Wow. And uh, um, 
Uh, eight is a very common spacing. Eight or nine is a very common spacing in other systems, but we use 12. Okay. And we get, we get more even temperatures out of 12 degrees than they can get out of uh, actually you'd have to go down to three degrees. I'm sorry, three inches on center to get as even a, a heat with any other system as you can get with warm board at 12 inches. That's pretty And cool. that's just simply the quality of the aluminum we use and how much of it we use. That's awesome. And Matt, one misconception out there too that I see is that people think that the floors actually get like really hot, kind of like running through beach sand in the summertime when you have to run through the sand. <laughs> um, so, so you get an idea. The surface temperatures of our tile floors or our hardwood floors, like Terry was showing you, they get to about 80 or 85 degree Fahrenheit which is relatively about your skin temperature. So the term that I use is it, it is a very powerful, powerful heating source, but the floors don't get hot. They get kind of lukewarm, if you would, as a description. It's actually one of the things people love about it is just walking around on mildly warm floors. It's just delightful to get up in the morning. My, my wife says we should just have an ad that shows a woman getting out of bed in the morning because we have nighttime setback uh, <laughs> in, our, in our bedroom. So we keep her bedroom about 67 degrees or so when we're sleeping. And uh, but if she gets up in the middle of the night, the floor is sitting there at about maybe 78 to 80 or so. If it's a nighttime setback. And then when it goes up again in the morning, it'll go, rise up to maybe 80 or 82 or so. And she says, you're so nice to get out of bed, put your feet, bare feet on a nice warm floor. And I'll That's give you cool. another uh, interesting little story. We have uh, a, uh, a sales lady, uh, a saleswoman who works for us up in uh, New England. And her uh, uh, little toddler was going off to preschool for the first time. And this pre the uh, preschool teacher was telling him that it was now slipper time to put on their slippers. And she looked at the teacher with a puzzled look and she says, what are slippers? <laughs> mm. oh, that's hilarious. I love and it. That says it all about radiant. <laughs> that's really cool. Uh, yeah. I want to talk boilers, guys. But before we do that, let's take a minute. Um, fill me in on some of the other radiant. Like if you were going to do baseboard radiant, let's say, or um, or maybe even old school radiant like our radiator like i had in my sears and roebuck house sure are can you give us any resources uh, i realize these are your, some of some of your competitors but i want to uh, give everybody the options who's thinking about radiant and maybe they'll come back to warm board but at least they'll have the chance to research it all can you throw out any names of manufacturers or some other options for those that people could look at Fairly famous manufacturer of baseboards is Runtall. I think it's a Swiss company, if memory serves. Uh, yeah, Runtall's a popular one. Hayden's another one. Hayden, yeah, for a baseboard. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know there's uh, uh, some Italian radiators, wall radiators that look beautiful. They're architecturally artistic. You know, they the, just the metals they make them out of and how they form them and the look of them is is almost a decorative fe feature in your home. Tubes Radiatore is one that comes to mind. Cool. Uh, so there are people in Europe, you see so much more um, hydronic heat because generally Europeans disdain forest air in all varieties. They just think the idea of hot dust blowing around your house is barbaric. <laughs> That's fine. And so even though um, um, Europe is uh, about 30 percent radiant floor generally, but I would say it's probably about 80 or 90 percent one form or another hydronic, which would include baseboards and uh, wall radiators. Wow. A huge percentage. All right. Yeah. So then with that said, let's switch gears and talk about how to get that hot water. What are the options out there? Uh, and I even want to dive into a little bit electric radiant uh, and some super efficient houses like my friends in the passive house community that, that have these crazy efficient homes that are moving towards all electric systems. But first, what are the what are the main options for people for uh, for making that water hot that goes into the floor? The, the, the most go to option is a boiler. Simply, you know, and I'd say the majority of radiant systems are powered by a boiler. Yeah. So natural and boilers gas have improved propane. a lot over the last few decades. Uh, we now have what are called condensing boilers. Mm -hmm. And all that means is that when any time you burn a, uh, a fuel in, uh, in, a, in a furnace or a boiler, the combustion components are CO2 and water vapor go up your flue. Yep. And that's the reason why when you look at that stack that comes out the top of your your uh, your house, you'll see a white plume. It doesn't look like, you know, uh, fuel burning. It looks like nice, pure white smoke. It's not actually white smoke. What that is, is the um, a water vapor is a colorless, odorless gas. Hmm. You can't see it. But when it encounters cold air, it's going to condense out just like it does in a cloud. And you'll see microscopic droplets, and that's the white that you see coming out of it. Oh, interesting. When you have a con but, but that means that water vapor is going up and out of the flue, and, and it's, that's carrying heat and it's wasting energy along the process. Yep. I think maybe about 20 years or so ago, people figured out, 
we should actually make boilers that operate in condensing mode, which means we, we, we didn't want them to operate in condensing mode because they were made out of cast iron. And if you ran a, a boiler at below 140 degrees, this condensation that would come out of the flue gases would condense on your heat exchanger and rot it out. It would rust it in a matter of, you know, a few months or a year or so. And so uh, they never ran uh, systems at below 140 degrees. Now this new technology runs on um, boilers 80, 90, 100, 110 degrees, and they like it because when it's operating at that temperature, it means that all the water vapor turns into back into water again which means you've extracted all the energy out of it. In fact, it's so efficient at extracting energy out of the flue gases that we make our flues out of PVC now. We make them out of plastic. They don't even need that metal to resist the heat anymore, right? Exactly. The, 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 what's coming out that stack is so cool, it's not going to melt or harm the plastic. And actually, the plastic gets along better with the, the residual little moisture that's in the flue gases that could cause rusting of a flue. Mm -hmm. So metal flues tend to rust out, but plastic flues don't. That's but awesome. be mindful, of course, when we spoke of the panel radiators or the baseboards, hydronic baseboards, you would not use a condensing boiler in that application. And that's because those products require high temp radiant, which is referred uh -huh. to as maybe 160 or 170 degree water, for example. Gotcha. And at those temperatures, there's no condensation happening. But when we went to condensing boilers, it used to be boilers had efficiency down around 65 or 70 percent. And what that meant is, is if you bur if you burned a uh, uh, hundred uh, BTUs of of uh, fuel, you'd get about seventy BTUs would go into your house, and about thirty BTUs would be going up your smokestack and uh, warming up the rest of the world and wasting yep. energy for you. Now, modern condensing boilers hit 95, 96, 97 percent even uh, efficiencies. That's awesome. But it is interesting to note that whenever they talk about those efficiencies, you have to look at the fine print in the specification. That's at a low temperature. That's one of our bragging rights is because we use the lowest temperature waters, we get the highest efficiencies out of anybody's boiler. Anybody's boiler is going to work better hooked up to warm board than any other panel. And, w and what temperature are you setting that boiler for, Terry? Did I miss that? Maybe you said it already, but is that 120? Is it 130, 140? Well, um, uh, old fashioned radiant systems, you set that temperature and it required uh, some calculations by uh, uh, a trained uh, radiant installer or mechanical engineer. And they would typically be operating at about the 120, 130, 140 range is not an unusual range for them to be operating at. Uh, our boiler that we have produced, we call it the warm source, and it's a super high efficiency boiler. It's about 96% efficient, I believe, memory serves. And uh, um, and it's uh, and we set it automatically for you, so it varies. Uh, we, we have a control system that's proprietary that we invented, and what it does it basically looks at the heat loss in every one of your rooms based on data that we collect from every one of your thermostats. We collect uh, data accurate to a hundredth of the degree every one minute uh, in every room of your house, and based on how every room is performing, we adjust that water temperature up or down. And you may find that sometimes in the day it's operating at ninety degrees. And then other times of the day, uh, it might be operating at 110 or 120 degrees. Hmm. It may be at, at, in the middle of the night if you have one zone that's not a nighttime reset and you need heat in that zone. Uh, and I do that in my own house because my wife likes to get really early and work out. So we leave that one room on all night. And, uh, and that may be requiring in the dead of winter, 120 degrees. Hmm. But uh, by midday, it may have ramped that temperature down to 90 degrees. That's amazing. And, not very uh, hot at that, all. That's really. something that our system does. That's cool. All right, talk to me uh, about electric radiant. This will probably be our last uh, our last topic to uh, to hit. But uh, you know, among my uh, peers, there's a lot of talk about passive house uh, and houses that are super super efficient uh, with crazy high insulation levels, with really really tight blower door scores, and typically really excellent glass uh, in the house. Which means we probably have way less uh, heating loads than traditional construction or older houses. Um, are there options for electric radiant? Well, yeah. And uh, uh, actually, electric radiant is probably the biggest component of radiant entirely in North America. It, you're from uh, Texas. I used to go down and visit with Texas architects. And I'd say, you guys uh, ever do any radiant down here? And they say, oh, every house in the bathrooms because people want to get out of the showers yep. and step on warm tiles, yep. not the rest of the house, but just in the bathrooms. 
And so uh, that's a huge industry is the bathroom floor warming business. Mm -hmm. We're not in that business, but that's a big portion of reading. Now that's resistive electric. Uh, there's a, I'll give you three letters in the, 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 the nerd category for your viewers. It's called COP. It stands for coefficient of performance. And it turns out that a BTU, which is, stands for British thermal unit, is the exact same measurement as a kilowatt. Some people rate boilers in Europe in kilowatts, not in BTUs. Mm -hmm. So you get converters that will tell you what the, the number, what the number scale differences are. It's like the difference between meters and feet, that sort of a thing. Gotcha. And so uh, you, if you uh, burn one kilowatt of electricity, you get by definition one kilowatt of heat out of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so that's a COP of one. And so anytime you're doing resistive electric, it is by definition a COP of one. And unless your electricity is really cheap, it's really expensive to run. Right. And in most states, you can't even do it. And now some places have really cheap electricity up in the Pacific Northwest where they have a, a lot of hybrid electric. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you're right next to a, a power plant and you can get cheap electricity. But unless you get cheap electricity, uh, electric rating is not an option for most people, not resistive electric, mm -hmm. but becoming more and more popular what are called heat pumps. Now, everybody has a heat pump in their house. They may not be aware of it, but a heat pump is a refrigerator, yep. essentially. Uh, what they do is they pump the heat out of your beer in your refrigerator, and they make that black coil on the back of the refrigerator get hot. And that's all a heat pump really does is yep. it takes uh, heat out of outside air, extracts the heat from it just like you did on the refrigerator, and it has a coil that will then you blow a fan past it, and it will heat your house. And uh, so that's a, a classic way that heat pumps work. And uh, they can get COPs if it's an air source heat pump, which means you're extracting heat from the outside air. You can get it as high as about three. It could, depends on the climate zone you're in. If you're in a mild climate like Austin, they probably work great. Yeah, they do. Uh, I've got one of my but house. If but if you live in, in Minnesota or Saskatchewan or places like that, you're screwed because uh, you're not going to be able to get much heat out of that air. There's, there is still latent heat in that air, but it's tough to extract it. So what they typically do with those systems is the heat pump will get you an air source heat pump will get you a COP on a good spring day, maybe as high as three, but maybe in a dead winter day, you're only getting 1.5 or 1.7 mm -hmm. COP, which means you're basically running a resistive electric system, which means it's expensive. Right. And, and so um, you can approve it if you use what's called a ground source heat pump. That's where instead of extracting the heat from air, you can extract it from the ground. And the nice thing about that is almost no matter what cold climate you're in, you dig down far enough, the soil's warm yep. because the earth's core is constantly radiating heat up. And so you can extract heat out of uh, ground source heat pumps, but they're very expensive to run because they require either fairly deep wells. You need to put a tube down into to extract that heat where you get horizontal trenches that are typically at least six feet deep. It's not only kind, of, kind of unlike a, a, a sewage field or septic tank field that you would have, like the leach lines for that. But you have these long trenches with uh, PEX tubing down inside of the extract heat from the soil. And they can get upwards to, uh, like I say, five. Is, it, the best of them do five. Yeah. Uh, so they can be fairly efficient. But uh, in general, most of these systems, whenever it's really cold out, you can't get enough heat out of them. And then they add what's called a, an inline heater into it. So they will boost the temperature that they got from the heat pump cycle with resistive electric, which that lowers your COPs down again. Yep. So the, generally the whole concept of electric works great. If, like you say, you have a highly efficient house in a mild climate, it's probably a great way to go. At my house under construction, I've got a, uh, a water heater called a uh, ECO2, uh, formerly called Sandin. Uh, it's a Japanese made product that um, I understand. Christoph Irwin tells me that it's, it's approaching a COP of four. Uh, and it's using CO2 gases as the refrigerant, which is kind of cool. So my 80 gallon tank, which is inside my house has two PEX lines to the outside and the, um, uh, compressor is outdoors, makes that hot water and then sends it into my inside tank. And I believe that I can set it as hot as 160 degrees. Uh, so I could see potentially maybe some future, uh, passive house builders using warm board, but maybe using a, a heat pump water heater like that potentially if the house was a uh, small enough load uh, or in a mild climate, like you mentioned. Well, any heat pump can put out 160 degrees, but usually not purely from heat pump. And I don't know if, they, if this one you're talking about can do it purely from heat pump action. They or, can't. Or, yeah, they're going to have an inline heater in that. Anytime you start getting up to those temperature ranges, most heat pumps 
max out of about 120 degree water. That's about the most you can get out of them. No, this one doesn't have an inline heater. It's uh, it's strictly heat pump, no resistant mm-hmm. whatsoever. Well, I have to look into that further. It sounds like interesting technology. Yeah. It's probably due to the fact that they're using CO2. All these uh, heat pumps that work on the, the principle that you know, gas expands and and uh, and cools down as as as, as, it, as it's expanding. And then when you compress it, it heats up. Yep. And so uh, uh, you have a cycle of heating and cooling of these gases, and that's how you pump heat out of uh, the soil or out of the air is through this uh, cycling of uh, expansion of gases and compression of gases. And when you look at those specifications, you need to look at um, like in your case, Matt the outdoor air temperature when they're making that clean Mm -hmm. because that's everything. Yeah. Good point, Paul. Guys, we're coming up on, uh, on an hour together. I think we could easily turn this into a a 10 part series. There's so much to talk about here. Uh, but for listeners that don't know warm board and are interested in learning more about you guys, how can people get in contact with you or learn more about your systems? We're very difficult to find. Our website is warmboard.com. (laughs) <laughs> that will tell you everything you need. Way to grab an awesome website. Stuff, just like you'd expect, W-A-R-M-B-O-A-R-D. That's real simple. Look it up. And and one of the things we pride ourselves on is not only do we make great products, but we have uh, a great company here. We are one of the few companies that when you call up, a live person answers the phone every time. We don't that? have a phone tree. That's you don't awesome. leave messages. You get and you will usually get in touch with somebody who knows Lots about the the technology. All of our salespeople are highly trained. Many of them are mechanical engineers, architects. That's the kind of people we hire to do our work. And when they have a question that stumps them, they talk to this guy. That's really cool. And and and, and, uh, and he's been doing it. You've been doing it for what twenty five years now. Twenty seven. Twenty seven years. Paul's been in the reading. That's industry. awesome. Very cool. You got so, into it when you were thirteen, and you just turned forty. <laughs> Precisely. <Yeah. Exactly. laughs> Terry, Paul, really appreciate it. Uh, very kind of you guys to take some time with me and talk about uh, rating in general and your system in particular. Guys, uh, if you're not currently a subscriber here, we'd love to have you hit that subscribe button. We publish this podcast every single Friday, and we have really uh, in interesting and impressive nerds like uh, Paul and Terry on with us who can really get into the nitty gritty uh, of specific topics about building science, about the business of building. Gosh, this is my time to really get in deep on topics. So I really appreciate you guys joining me for the Build Show podcast. Hit that subscribe button. Follow me on Twitter, Instagram. Otherwise, we'll see you next time on the Build Show. Build Show.